wanted to spend some time talking to you about leadership. And certainly as a USC Aiken student, we uh, encourage leadership opportunities both on and off campus. But oftentimes we just say, I want you to be a leader. Or why aren't you a leader? Why aren't you taking leadership roles and responsibilities? And we really don't stop and define what leadership is and what are those qualities that we want you as USC Aiken students to have that are transferable once you graduate. We often say here on campus that once we, we build leadership skills in you here, those leadership skills will transfer with you and carry with you throughout the rest of your life. So what does it mean to be a leader? What are those skills, those subtleties that leaders have that enable them to not necessarily just lead, but to lead a purposeful life. Many of you may have um, been familiar with Stephen Covey's book. It's probably, what, a couple decades old by now, The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. This really set leadership on its ear because he's talking about some very, very simple, applicable strategies that people have that, that are used within multiple settings that create movement, that create action, that create purpose-driven lives. And so I want to go over these, these habits with you, spinning the context within leadership and how can you as a USC Aiken student now become a, a, a leader of choice, a leader of purpose, a leader of vision, and how are those skills going to be to your benefit as you transition from the university? The university. There are seven habits in the habit, and the first habit is to be proactive. You have two choices. You can be out front or you can be behind. So being out front means anticipating what is coming down the road. I see something, something doesn't feel right, something's coming my way. What is that? I often equate this to, you know, folks in a tornado. You see the tornado, you see it coming, what is your response? Mm, it's not gonna get me. I've been living in this house for 30 years, never had a tornado, it's going to go to someone else's farm, it's gonna go to someone else's house. Being proactive is saying, oh my heavens, even if it doesn't come my way, I need to be up front, I need to be out front, I need to be prepared. So how do you as a leader anticipate what is about to come? We don't have a crystal ball, but we do have intuitions. We do have this sense of, I need to be prepared for, rather than reacting to the tornado as it spins across your front yard, then what? Then what are you gonna do? It's too late. So the first habit is to think, of, uh, think ahead. Think of what is to come. Be anticipatory rather than always catching up. We tend to find leaders that are proactive are thinking not necessarily just about today, but they're thinking about next week, they're thinking about next month and next year, rather than, oh my gosh, I don't really care about tomorrow, I just need to focus on today. And absolutely, leaders need to solve the problems that are generated in real time. But also, leaders are thinking beyond the curve, beyond the possibilities. And so that's what habit number one is, thinking beyond the curve. So you're at the start line, right? You're at, you're at the start line, you're running your own race. Do you wait for somebody to fire the gun? Obviously you're not gonna right, jump the gun here. But what do you do? How do you start the process? What are you thinking about when you're ready to take initiative? When you're ready to move forward? So proactive people take responsibility. This is not a blame game. Leaders aren't gonna play the blame game. Leaders are going to say, this was my decision. This was my vision. This is where I hoped we were going to move. And maybe we succeeded, maybe we didn't. But it's that sense of responsibility, of ownership, of my vision. I owned that vision. I was proactive. I was out front. And I will take responsibility for the successes. And I will certainly take responsibility for the failures. Think before they act. 
this, and we're going to talk about one of the, the habits is that sense of reflection is you have to have information. You have to have a, a vision before you act. If you don't, you're just reacting. You're just saying, you know, we've also, we've heard of these knee jerk responses. We're moving away from knee jerk responses as a leader. We're moving towards a more purposeful vision of a response based upon anticipating what is to come. So thinking beyond the present. Bounced back when faced with adversity. This is really hard to do sometimes. Leaders have to do this all the time. If you are not willing to accept the leader leadership position, then you're really not willing to accept that things are going to fall apart. So what do you do when you're faced with adversity? Do you sit in your dorm room? Do you sit in your office? Do you sit right and, and you just fester? Or do you pick yourself up and say, how do I make this better? What did I miss in this process? How am I going to move forward with this process? That's what leaders do. Finding a way to solve the problem. Always finding a way to solve the problem. This is such an, a key aspect of leadership is not necessarily saying, well, it will solve itself or, or we'll get there eventually. If here's an issue, this is a problem. How am I going to solve this problem? You are out front of the problem. You're anticipating the problem. You're dealing with it in a proactive way rather than delegating, let someone else take responsibility, let someone else take the vision, let someone else take the fall. You're the leader. You set the tone, you set the responsibility, you make things happen. Things happen. I love this, vi this visual. So it seems that the odds are against you. How do you as a leader turn obstacles into opportunities? How do you take these two chess pieces and say, how can I defeat a seemingly insurmountable set of chess pieces that are, are, are tailored to my loss. How do you as a leader take adversity and say, this just didn't work well. Something happened here. It didn't quite figure out the way I wanted it to figure out, but by golly, I am now given an opportunity to make a difference. How do you vision things as a leader? Do you vision this particular image is, I'm never gonna win, so why try? Or do you envision this visual as, you know what, this is gonna be kind of tough. I'm not quite sure I'm gonna make it, but here's a few strategies that I can take to become successful. Love this, respond intelligently even to unintelligent treatment. We have all been in conversations where we hear some pretty dumb stuff and we have opportunities to either challenge or you rise above and you say, you know what? I'm not going to get in the mud. I'm not going to say something slanderous. I'm not going to say something that's derogatory or, or divisive. I'm going to, even if somebody says that I'm not going to be successful, I'm going to continue to plot my path. I'm going to continue to believe in myself. I'm going to continue to believe in my vision even when the odds are stacked against me. Even when folks are saying, you know what, that's just the dumbest idea in the world. You're rising above, you're, you're showing your integrity, you're showing your leadership skills, you're being proactive by saying, I'm going to continue this challenge and this opportunity irrespective of what is thrown my way. And certainly three attributes is being self-aware. I can observe my own thoughts and feelings. We've all had this. This is just intuition, guys. It's intuition. This just doesn't feel right, right? The initiative that I thought was going to work, it's not working. So when does a leader pull the plug? When does a leader say, you know what? I tried this. It's just not working. I thought it was the right direction to go. I need to recalibrate. I need to regroup. I need to rethink. That's being self-aware rather than we've all seen folks that stay on that same path, even though we know it's kind of a losing path, they stay on it. And you're thinking, dude, why didn't you just bail on that, you know, a week ago? Why are you still involved here? 
It's that sense of knowing when to cut your losses and run. And that is what good leaders do all the time. That sense of imagination. Look at Walt Disney, you know. Walt Disney, quick story, he was, you want to talk about folks saying you're you're just this loon, right? Living out there in Southern California when he envisioned Disney World. Folks said, or Disneyland, right? Folks said, never going to happen. Never going to make it. No one's going to come. Who's going to come from a mouse, right? Never going to happen. And Walt Disney had this, had this vision. And he had the persistence. And he saw beyond the curve. And he said, this, is, can, this can be something innovative. This could be something unique. This could be something that folks can really enjoy. And that vision drove his determination where I can make this happen. There were so many obstacles put in Walt Disney's way when he was building Disneyland. So many obstacles. And he kept on track. Did he have to make accommodations and modifications as he went? Absolutely, that's what good leaders do. But it's knowing when, you, when you're on the right path, it's knowing when you're not on the right path. It's having the imagination and the creativity to dream the big dream and also sticking to it, making sure that you are determined to make your dream come true. true. Habit number two is begin with the end in mind. And this really dovetails perfectly into what it means to be proactive. What do you want to achieve? What's the end game? So you can imagine Walt Disney waking up one day and saying, you know, wouldn't it be cool to have this big theme park and where parents can come and they have different, you know, Tomorrowland and Frontierland and different aspects, right? I mean, when you, could you imagine listening to him? My first impression would be, you've lost your nut, right? You, this is, no one's ever done this before. You're building out in the middle of nowhere, right? Remember guys, this was out in Anaheim, which at the, at the time in the 50s, it was farmland. I mean, you, you didn't go to Anaheim for any reason except a farmer if you lived out there. There was nothing out there. And he said, no, nope, this is where I'm going to build it, and this is my vision. This is what I want at the end of my time, right? Beginning with the end in mind. What is your goal? What is your goal? What are the small steps that you're going to take, your objectives, to reach your goal. goal. So here she stands. She's got a ton of choices. A ton of choices. It's not an option. Fear is. So I guarantee you that Walt Disney had some sleepless nights where he's thinking, ah, this whole thing's just costing me way too much money. I'm not even sure folks are gonna come. I have no idea who's gonna show up at this theme park. But you know what? I have a vision. I think it's going to work. I'm convinced that it's going to work. And you're determined to plow forward. Fear is paralyzing as a leadership, as a leader. You know this. Fear is just paralyzing. Fear of making a decision. Fear of having a dream. Fear of being convicted by which you're saying, I really am invested in this and I'm going to make sure that this works. We can think of a thousand different ways why, why something's not going to work. What we need to find is that one way that makes it work. Makes it work. And here it is. So what's that one way? What's that one path towards your success as a leader? And you are invariably going to have to travel down several paths that lead to nowhere but you take those as opportunities. You take that obstacle of failure to an opportunity of success, but you can't find success unless you deal with failure and have to understand that failure is part of the success process. It's invaluable. Every single time you learn from the failures that you've made and you retweak, you reconfigure, you refine your vision, your attitude, your perspective, and you inch constantly closer towards success. Yes. Beginning with the end in mind. So these are these are characteristics that I hope you, sorry guys, I, my email keeps buzzing off. These are characteristics that we hope you have here at USC Aiken. 
you have them in your classes, you have them in your fraternities and sororities, you have them in the relationships that you have, in the interactions that you have off campus. But leaders think about vision and tenacity and courage, the courage to fail risk, how much you're willing to, to invest, to take that chance. Teamwork, planning, flexibility, humility. Beginning with the end in mind, what is your ultimate goal and your ultimate objective? And not just saying it will happen. You have to chart that path towards success. Habit number three, putting first things first. So how many of you are procrastinators? How many of you guys like to wait to the last minute to crank out your papers at two or three in the morning? That wasn't me. I, I, when I was an undergraduate, I just had to get everything done early. That just was the way that I felt comfortable. I don't work well under pressure, so I know that about myself, and I knew that all those years ago, that I just didn't work well under pressure. Some of you do, and you work very well under pressure, and you can start a paper at 3 in the morning and crank that thing out, and it's, it's magical. Some of us aren't blessed with that kind of... Um, of skill. So how do you prioritize your time? What's the most important thing that drives you? And what are those things that you have left by the wayside that don't necessarily inspire you? Barely inspire you? So you look at this kind of, you know, quadrangle here, quadrant, and you particularly think of your own schoolwork. Right? How do you divide your time? How do you partition your time? Because I know you hear this all the time as a USC Aiken student. You have to spend a certain amount of hours outside of class studying for in-class stuff. And we get it, right? But how do you prioritize your moments here? What takes your time? I've taught many of students who have spent more time at places that they shouldn't be spending time in, right? And their schoolwork suffers. And so it's really, it's, it's, it's a one-to-one -one relationship. I was here and I wasn't spending my time working on your assignments. And it shows. I've also had several students that spend nothing of their time except on schoolwork and they really don't have much of a social engagement outside of school. Might not necessarily be the best balance either. So when you think of time and time allotment and time attribution and time management, how do leaders spend their time? Do they fester, 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 and they just can't get over that one mistake that they made? Or do they think about the mistake? Do they process the mistake and then move forward? Do they handle the most important things immediately and let everything else fall? Do they know where, have they anticipated where there might be problems? So when problems arise, they knew that it was coming, kind of anticipated it, don't really want it, but it's here and I have to address it. So I'm just going to leave this up here and not necessarily go through it particularly because I'm sure you guys can intuitively understand what this means, but you know, how do you manage your time as a leader? What's left of you and your relationships, your schoolwork, your work work, your family life, your family commitments, your outside of school commitments? Where do you see yourself spending your time? And are you spending your time productively? Are you getting the biggest bang for your buck as you spend your time? It's pretty simple. Planning for now, planning for tomorrow, planning for something that may never happen, and how do you prioritize those plans? And then how do you pass muster, right? How do you how do you how does that plan work out? How do you you pass the test? You right you have that and I'm going to come back to the tornado in your front yard, right? You have that that shelter underneath your house. You've planned for it. You've had it in there for 30 years. You've never had to use it. But what happens if that one time you need it? And so you've passed the test, right? You're safe. But if you didn't think you needed that precaution, you never would have built the shelter. It's never going to happen to me. Nothing ever happens to me. Look, we haven't had that problem here forever. 
It's not necessarily the best use of your time or your energy or planning to be successful. How do you plan, prioritize, and then pass based upon the moments that you use, the time that you have, that you have? Is this you? So how do you respond to pressure? Some of us crack, some of us sink, some of us rise. If you know how you are your best self and under which contexts you are your best self, you will rise. But that self-identification, that self-awareness, which we talked about a little bit ago, it's self-actualization where you say, I really work well under pressure and that's when I get my best stuff done. Or I don't work past six o'clock at night because I'm useless at night. It's knowing yourself and how do you understand those stress points that make you successful or that make you stumble. Leaders do the same thing every day. It's understanding who we are, how we respond to pressure because pressure is coming. How do you respond to it? Did you anticipate it? Did you, were you proactively thinking about, you know, this just might not work and if it doesn't work, how do I respond to it? Or did you just say, I'm gonna let it roll and if it falls apart, I'll deal with it then. Then you're reactive, then you're playing catch up. So how do you respond to pressure? Habit number four is think win-win and you are going to have to give something up here. So often, you have been in conversations, I know I've been in conversations, where somebody has just dug their heels into the sand and they're not moving. Their point of view is absolute. Their point of view is not to be challenged because if you challenge it or if you refute it, you're made fun of, you're, you're ridiculed. It's knowing when you need to give and knowing when you need to get. It's thinking win-win. It's finding, it's creating, it's not finding, it's creating a situation where as a leader, everybody is going to get something, something. And here's this notion of abundance. You're not getting everything, but you're gonna get what you need and it's gonna be enough. So as a leader, when do you know when to give when do you know when to get? Because as a leader, if you walk in and you say, this, it is my way, it's no one else's way, this is how it's gonna roll, and this is what it's gonna be like. Do leaders sometimes have to make those kind of decisions? Absolutely. But if that is your only leadership style, chances are you're really not gonna have very many folks following you, and chances are you're probably not gonna be a leader very long. It's understanding when to give and take. And this, again, this notion of abundance is so imperative to thinking how to win-win. It's changing your mindset to realizing that it is okay if you don't get everything, but you're gonna get enough. And that other person, that other group, that other organization, they're going to get enough too, by which everybody gets enough of what they need to be successful, to continue the conversation, to continue moving forward. Meet me halfway. This is hard. Sometimes this is really, really hard because we, we have the plan, we've designed the plan, we've thought about the plan, it's my plan, I don't wanna give it to anybody else, why aren't you following my plan? It's perfect. It's the way we've always done things here. And somebody says, you know what? Maybe there's another way. Maybe we can do this differently. Maybe we can present this thing in, in another perspective. And you're thinking, oh, no, 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 no. This is the way we've always done it. This is the way. It's my plan. I've always done it this way. And so that person who is saying, maybe we need to think about it in another way becomes a threat becomes a, a challenge or a challenger. And how do we as leaders respond to folks that are perceived to be threats or perceived to be challengers? I look at it completely differently. I look at folks that say, have you looked at something this way as collaborators? I look at folks that say, have you thought about doing this as an asset? They're not threatening me. 
They're adding to my understanding of the issue. And I'll tell you something really simply, guys. During student evaluations, I read every single student evaluation because that's how I become better at what I do. So when a student says, Dr. Littner, have you ever thought about doing something this way? I could easily say, oh my gosh, I'm the professor, you're the student, you don't know anything, I'm the one in control. And a lot of folks do that. I always look at my student comments and say, you know what, maybe I, sh maybe I should. That's a really, really good idea. I, ha I can't tell you how many changes I have made through the years to the way I teach and what I teach based upon my student comments because they have something to offer. They have their sense of, uh, of abundance. They want to get something. Now, is it too late? Yes, because it's the end of the course. But how do we compromise? How do we feel good as leaders saying, that's a really good opinion. That's a really good perspective, one that I've never thought about. Let's think about that and how we can change the way we do it. Or, oh my gosh, that's the dumbest thing that you've said. We've always done it this way. We're not going to change anything. That's not going to get you moving forward as a leader. You must give to get. How much are you willing to give up as a leader? And how much are you willing to listen to others to make you a better leader? Habit five, seek first to understand, then to be understood. My sister-in-law is horrible at this. Every time you say something like, oh, I went to Kroger and bought, I don't know, some Lucky Charms. She'll say, oh my gosh, I've gone into Kroger, the Lucky Charms, they're hot, right? She always has to say something about something else. She's always interjecting her, and I, I do enjoy her, but this is stuff, it, it just bugs me. She's always interjecting herself into a conversation that really doesn't have anything to do with her. And we've all been around people like this, and I'm guilty of this too. I really have to kind of self-check myself. It's because it's very easy to say, oh yeah, I've seen that movie. Oh yeah, I've done that. Hasn't, isn't this, there's nothing worse when, when something happened to you that's really exciting and you go, you know what, I went uh, rock climbing over this weekend and it was so much fun. And then the person says, oh, I've done that 500 times. And you're going, why didn't you just say, boy, I'm really glad you had fun. That's really cool. Rather than interjecting themselves into your conversations. How do you as a leader Stop and listen and understand where somebody's coming from first before you respond. Congratulations on your canny ability to make this something that is not about you. This is hard for us to do. It's hard for me to do sometimes. Because we want to interject. We want to say, I've been there. I've done that. Oh, it's wonderful. Rather than just saying, I don't need to say anything except, I'm really glad that you did that. I'm really excited that you saw that movie. Or I'm really glad that you went and bought Lucky Charms out of Kroger. It doesn't matter. Leaders listen. Leaders understand. Where is this? Why is that person saying we need to do things differently? What's the intent? And if you understand the intent, if you understand where people are coming from, you're much better able to make cogent, concise, responsive decisions rather than always having everything about you. Leaders think that everything is about them because look, I'm the leader. It's all about me. It's not all about you. It's all about the people that are around you that are contributing to your leadership and to the collective vision. That's what leadership is. Are you listening to them? Are you validating what they say? Are you truly understanding them as a leader? And, and how are you creating these communities and these opportunities by which folks around you can contribute their thoughts, their perspectives, their actions that make you a better leader and make the, the, the vision that you collectively have more realistic. 
it's all about listening. I worked with uh, a, a leader several years ago, and he was so busy. I tell you what, he was so busy. I don't see how he he got out of bed each morning. He just every day was just slammed. But every time I walked into his office, he would put everything down that he was working on, and he would look directly at me. So for those three minutes, those five minutes, I had his undivided attention. He was genuinely focused on what I wanted to say. And it really was amazing, how, and he did this for everybody. It was staggering how good of a listener he was. He blocked out everything, and he said, you know, I've got five minutes, but those five minutes are focused on nothing but you. How do we do that as leaders? How do we block out all the other distractions and all the other things that we have when someone says, I've got an idea. I have a vision. Do we listen? Do we just say, yeah, I heard you, but not, or do we stop and we genuinely look at them and say, what value, what value can you bring here? Let's, let's talk about this. That sense of standing in their shoes. You know, where are folks coming from? Why, why is this vision coming my way? I understand you. I understand the process. I understand your urgency. That sense of I am with you in this process comes with listening. Listening to what folks have to say. This is a really, really hard skill to master because so often we are torn in a thousand different directions and to give somebody three minutes five minutes 20 minutes of our of our undivided attention very very difficult to do but i cannot stress to you how important listening is to leadership it's your turn what do you have to say Right? As a leader, you're, you're asking folks, what do you have to say? How can you contribute? How does this sound to you? This is kind of my vision. How does it sound to you? It's your turn. Let them have their turn. Listen to them. Habit number six is synergizing. How do you get everybody moving in the same direction? I like looking for differences. I like looking for outliers. I like looking for folks that are doing things just a little bit differently because that keeps everybody moving forward. If everybody did the same thing, we would never move forward as an individual, as a group, as a university, whatever kind of collective you're in. So how do we synergize, right? And, and so this notion of synergy is getting everybody together and moving in the same direction. But now this says, well, seek out differences. So how does difference make us better leaders that produces that sense of synergy where we're all moving forward? If you don't have everybody's voice, if you don't have and value everybody's perspective as a leader, and that's that sense of difference, you're never gonna synergize the group. You're always gonna have factions. This group wants to go this way, that group wants to do this thing, this group thinks it's a ridiculous idea, this group thinks that it's the best thing that we've ever done. How do you rally those different opinions and perspectives and viewpoints? Because that's difference. And you want differing opinions, you want differing perspectives as a leader. You don't want folks to just tell you what you already know. You want folks to say, let's look at it this way. Let's stop this process because it's not working, but let's kind of reconfigure so we're able, we're better able to position ourselves for success down the road. You want differing voices. You want differing perspectives. You seek those out as a leader. What do you have to offer? How do you envision this? Because once you get everybody's perspective, then you're building this sense of synergy, at least the synergy around my voice is valued within this particular leadership perspective. As a leader, you value difference because difference 
brings synergy. Differences bring folks together. And your job as a leader is to articulate a vision and to get everybody moving at the same time towards the same goal. And terribly difficult to do if you have not done all the other habits. This doesn't happen by saying, okay guys, we're all gonna do this and it's gonna be great. You're with me, let's go. Folks are going, no, it's not great. And no, I'm not with you because I have reservations about your vision. I have reservations about the path. I have reservations about this initiative. So before you, you go out and implement leadership opportunities, you seek difference, you seek opinion, you listen, you anticipate, you rally the troops, you value the people that are around your table and the differing opinions that you have because difference makes us better. That sense of synergy. Now that I have, I, I, I've given folks an opportunity to voice and value their opinion and incorporated those opinions and differences and perspectives into this new vision, then we go out and we do it as a whole rather than kind of dictating what's going to happen without seeking anybody's input. Anybody's input. So which, you know, which little duckling are you? Are you the first one that's moving up? Everybody's following you because you apparently have the vision. But I always look at the duck in the back, right? I mean, is that duckling going, wait a second, I'm not sure this is the right path to go. Somebody's got to lead. Somebody has to take the, 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 the reins here. Somebody has to be the first one to climb up that little sand dune so the others go, this can be done. And that first person needs to be you. But you're just not going to climb up this little sand dune thinking, you know what, I am just really never thought about it. I'm just going to come, right? You have a plan. You have a purpose. You've executed. The, the, you've thought about the contingencies. You've rallied the troops. Everybody is behind you. You're moving in one direction. Is everybody going to go in the same direction at the same time? No. But you've built that sense of synergy. You've built that sense of we are in this together. I value you. You value the vision. We're moving forward together. And together is what leaders build. You build together. You don't build it's just me and then I'm dictating to you. You build that sense of collaboration, community, cohesion, synergy. And that takes purposeful time and effort. And the last habit is sharpening the saw. So how do you stay sharp as a leader? How do you refine yourself? yourself? How do you hone your craft? So here's this old notion of, well, I'm going to be a leader. And the best way to hone my leadership craft is to volunteer to be a leader for everything. And I'm not necessarily sure of, um, I agree with that. I would much rather have leaders take on small, significant responsibilities and do those well than volunteer for every leadership opportunity and things start to fall between the cracks. So how do you hone your craft? Is it quantity over quality? I would argue that quality is the way to hone your craft. Thinking about the decisions that you make, seeing small victories that enable you to move on to another victory rather than have your hand into every leadership opportunity here on or off campus and really you're not getting anything done. So how do you sharpen your leadership saw? saw. I, I, I'm a big advocate of self-reflection and kind of this notion of self-preservation where there's a time where you just need to get away to reflect. There's a time where you need to get away to think about you as a person, the relationships that you have, the leadership opportunities that you've created. Are they working? Are they not? It's so often, it's so easy for us as leaders to get just immersed in these opportunities and these initiatives that we have that we lose sight of of, of us, we lose sight of who we are and what we like to do. I know some of you guys, right, you, you, you like to either work out, you like to binge watch on Netflix, you like to go right out, 
absolutely perfect. That's part of sharpening your saw. It's part of being a good leader is knowing when to just leave it alone. It's putting that leadership opportunity away for a while and doing something fun, doing something that may not necessarily have anything to do about leadership at all, but finding opportunities to take a step back, to reinvigorate ourselves, to refresh ourselves as leaders, to really maybe not think about leadership and to become a better person a more relaxed, maybe more refreshed person. So when we do revisit those leadership opportunities we have, we come with clarity, we come with more confidence, we come with a sense of purpose, rather than looking at leadership as an obligation, we now look at leadership as an opportunity to become better. Just wanted to end with this particular book. This book absolutely 